Hey, welcome back everyone. Rob here from Ram Studio Comics. So in today's video, I'm going to ink part of this artwork, talk a little bit about that, specifically uh, Wanda or Scarlet Witch's hair. Uh, I've been watching some WandaVision, so I figured I would do a fan art piece, but obviously using more of the comic style version of the characters uh, in this one. So uh, yeah, so, so before we get started, just want to let you guys know that you can find my content on Skillshare if you want to learn more on how to draw. And uh, I'll make sure there's a link in the description box below. I've got lots of classes on there. And I've also got Ram Studios Art School uh, on, through my own website. So you can check out the course content there. That's a, a one time you purchase it. You own the course content uh, for the duration. And you're good to go. Skillshare, it's a, a monthly kind of like a Netflix kind of uh, format. So at any rate, uh, let's jump in today and do some of this inking. I'm working off an iPad Pro. I actually finally updated my iPad after... Four, almost five years uh, but I'll tell you it works the same as the previous one so I'm using Procreate and uh, the Apple Pencil and everything's the same but what I like more about this new one is it actually uh, the case in the way that it holds the, uh, the Apple Pencil uh, automatically charges so there was a lot of times I'd be working and I would forget to charge my Apple Pencil and I'd run out of battery life uh, well, that seems to be a thing of the past because now I, it's al almost always fully charged because of the way the case and the charger works now. So that was a great update in and of itself. So as I ink this hair, uh, you know, obviously it's already drawn, but I'm going to kind of explain really the, the idea behind even the drawing process as I ink it uh, because I, I tend to do this in a similar fashion. So what I do, did for the hair is I take a larger brush. Uh, actually the same brush I've been drawn with the uh, this uh, Ram tech pen I'll link it in the description box below but it's basically just a modified version of the uh, technical pen inside of procreate and what I'll do is I'll turn the opacity down and some of this I will draw with lines and other aspects of the art I will draw with value so if you look at her her suit you can see there's shadows in there uh, the cape is a good example. See all this big blocked out area right there? I draw that in really quickly with value and it helps me uh, pick apart my shadows but I also do the hair the same way now. So as I'm inking it I'm really just retracing those steps but what I like to do is really pay attention to the shapes that I see here. Okay so if you notice the area I just did it kind of looks like a bunch of uh, wavy like shapes right? Thick to thin, thick to thin so there's a bit of repetitive uh, well, maybe not repetitive behavior, but there is a, a little bit of a pattern there. So I guess somewhat repetitive. Uh, you don't want it to look too repetitive because hair is very organic and it needs to have an energy and a flow to it. So if you if you do the same pattern too much, I think it kind of hurts it. So just be aware of that. But it's, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for uh, speed and patterns generally will will speed you up. So... If you want to get faster you are going to repeat some of those patterns if you want there to be a more natural uh, fluidity then you're going to you know shy away from some of those patterns uh, somewhat so yeah so right here just you know using some of that uh, those negative lines as well as I'm inking this uh, you can also ignore those and just go back uh, and tone back the opacity to the layer by doing a two finger tap pulling over and then going back and doing your negative lines so you don't have to draw around them as I'm doing so there's definitely times I do both where I'll draw around the the shapes and lines and other times I will just go back obviously you can drag and drop the um, uh, the color swatch and do quick fills um, I try to do a little bit of both as that as far as that's concerned as well because what happens is I find that if I draw my my outlines of these shapes in a way where I feel like I'm, I'm going to fill it in. Like I feel like I'm drawing it in a way where I'm just going to go back and block it in like this. I tend to get a little bit better uh, perimeter shape and outlining. But if I, if I start getting too much in the habit of just drawing these shapes in to fill them, something about the way that I do it, I get lazy and I start to end up with less um, than desirable results. So that's just me. It's something I have to be aware of. Like I said, for me personally, I like to draw these in 
almost like I'm drawing them with a regular pen and I'm just going to fill them in anyways. Something about that, for me, uh, gives me a little bit better representation of the shapes I'm trying to create. But there's times I'll block it off like that, make sure your edges are closed, drag and drop. And I always have to fill it in just a little bit because this brush must have just a little bit of uh, anti-aliasing, anti-aliasing on it. So basically the edges aren't as solid black as they could be. Uh, I tend to find I like brushes that have a little bit of a soft edge to the brush tip shape. Personally, I think it looks more natural. It's something about digital can look too uh, rigid if everything is overly crisp. There's a lot of times I'll go back when I'm done inking and I'll actually soften up my edges by doing a, uh, a blur to the line work. So I don't do that in every piece, but uh, it just depends. If it looks too awfully crisp, I purposely soften up the, uh, the edge work. Kind of silly, right? Um, so again, I'm drawing some of this in. I could just, if this gets too hard to do, and really it's kind of a little bit of a waste of time right there, I can just block that in. Again, come back. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably start doing that because this is going to be faster to come back with that little bit of uh, fine line whiteout or, you know, eraser on the, um, on the software and put those back in. Yeah, just kind of going through here, picking this apart. So you see I got a lot of little uh, line separations. Yeah, I keep finding myself drawing around what's there. And then I like to pull back like this and you know, and I'm I want to also be aware of the patterns or shapes that I'm getting. To me, there's a lot of like swirling kind of uh S hooks and W like uh patterns that I see. And uh, that's what I want. I tend to see that in not only art that I create, but art that I admire. Uh, so that's probably where I got it. I think the first person uh, whose art I really picked up on this from was uh, Dale Kean, And he does hair like better than any artist I've ever seen. It's like, uh, it, it's just hard to compete with uh, Dale Kean and the way that he does hair. Um, I don't think anybody can compete with it. It's just just a, a fluidity about it that's amazing and he does these little negative lines uh, like I'm doing here so again that's where I got it from I'm I'm sure I pale in comparison trying to do it but I oftentimes think of uh, you know his work on uh, well anything really I, I check out all his work but you know his work on Hulk is where I first picked up on it I was like man why does the hair look so cool you know and uh, it's just that he has this fluidity and this swirling kind of these patterns. It almost reminds me of water a little bit. And yeah, it's it's not the easiest thing to get right. But, uh, but once you start to recognize that a lot of this is kind of flowing in and around and through itself in a sense, it's, it's really not that bad. It's just, it's kind of easy to get lost in it as well. Um, but I, I really think that when I when I draw that in with the value, like I mentioned earlier, it makes it a lot easier to process. Something about that for me just really makes my life a lot easier. If I go to draw this line by line, it's not going to come out like this. But when I when I blend it in with value, when I block it in with a bigger brush and, and value and then erase back, I generally can get a lot nicer result. So yeah, so just keep that in mind. I think it's more of a I don't want to say a painterly effect, but it's less like drawing and more like blocking it in uh, and thinking of the tones and the value more than the um, individual way that I would draw hair, something to that extent. Okay, so block that all in. I can fill this in, and if I need to, I could erase a few lines back. I'll probably do that at the end. Another thing that I tend to do is I make sure that all this kind of comes down into into black okay and the neat thing about procreate is you can hold these curves and it will smooth out the curve for you you can also play with the streamline feature but I don't I don't like adjusting that in fact let me double check where I'm at I'll just at least show you where the streamline feature is yeah I'm at about 25 percent so I'm not totally not using it but you can bump that way up and you'll get like a you'll see letter artists do that quite a bit so they can get these nice 
uh, lines for their curves. I like using this method. So what I'm doing is I'm just drawing out a portion of the curve and I'll hold it. I also try to get the line weight right where I want it as well. Now in this case I'm filling it in so I really don't need to worry too much about line weight but what I want is the point to be relatively clean so I don't have to go back and erase the tips to get the point that I want. Get those little beauty curls in there. Not sure where I want to take this part right here. So when in doubt, just go for it. Yeah, I'll probably go back and clean that up. And this is her shoulder here. But yeah, at the very base of the hair, I tend to bring this all to black. I think it, it kind of rounds out the, uh, let me just go through this. I keep telling myself to do it, and then I stop and go around it slower. Give me an opportunity to show you how I can clean that up anyways. So yeah, so bring that all to black like this. Don't worry about some of this being you know, uh, negative space drawing or whatever. You can get that later. Just fill it in and then come back to it. I'll, I'll show you when I get there. But yeah, I think that what it does, is it makes the, the highlights more pronounced if you do that. Uh, I don't really like the the ends that I got there. And I think that's because I drew them too, or I, I uh, used that curve a little too much. So sometimes you also want to play around with just drawing the very tips. Kind of throwing the lines on some of this. I think this shape kind of bugs me. Kind of break that up a little bit. This one's really bothering me. Now, a lot of people would probably use the selection tool for this. I I really need to practice that. I've seen artists do it and it's it's pretty neat because you save so much time. I don't usually get the results I like, but I'm not liking the curve line right there. Just draw this out. Maybe I can get it done faster if I do that. Yeah, I'm guilty of saying, oh, you know, I do it this way, and then all of a sudden I go to do it, and something's not working, and I do it a different way. But uh, I think that's just part of being an artist. Like, I'm always running into roadblocks and changing it up a bit. But as long as I get it done, that's the main thing. But it's never an identical... Well, I, should, I shouldn't say never. Sometimes it's identical an identical process, but... Not always. Sometimes you just got to do something else and get through it. So I'm trying to throw some of these lines. You know, I, I put another screen protector on this one, and I don't, it's so weird. I, I like it and I don't. Uh, there's parts of the artwork that I create, and I really enjoy the way it slows down the uh, brush stroke. Penciling is a good example. really like it for the, uh, the way that the pencils come out. But I'll tell you, I don't think I like it as much for my inking process. And I don't have the, the one in front of me. It's, um, I might go back to my, my eye cares one. So, so far that seems to be the best, the best one all around that I tend to use. Uh, this one is a little more like a paper-like. It's not a paper-like, but it's uh, it doesn't have as much tooth as a paper-like, which is what I liked about it because I felt like paper-like was just too much tooth, too sandy, too sandpaper-like, uh, and it really slowed down the the Apple Pencil too much. I even even felt like it was tearing up the uh, the nib, but um, but this one 
has a little bit of tooth. You, I don't know if you can hear it, but you probably can hear it. But it has, um, you know, very little tooth to it. But I'll tell you, for inking, I like that fluidity. I like that flow more than I like the, the grip. So weird. There's just no perfect set of tools, folks. Just doesn't happen like that. The trick is really getting good with what you got and finding a a process for the tools that you have and then sticking with it. But that's so hard in the, in the uh, digital world because things are ch changing so fast and then you want to take advantage of all these uh, amazing gadgets. But then you can constantly be in a state of uh, relearning over and over again. And I think there's certain aspects of the work where you just want to be comfortable and create, not have to relearn all the time. That's why I kind of wish they wouldn't do updates so much or twist your arm to do updates. It should be where the uh, the new update comes out, but it doesn't negatively impact you in any way to stay where you're at. And you can kind of say, well, that's the way it is, but it's really not. Like if you don't do your updates long enough on any of these devices, they'll start to not be backwards compatible. And I think that's a mistake. I think it really needs to be where you know, don't don't force people to update the uh, the device so much, because then you're you're just constantly a beta tester, basically. Especially if you update immediately, you're always you're like the beta testers to it in, in the sense. It seems like they're always releasing it, and there's still problems with it. But um, but yeah, enough of my complaining here. Um, so again, I'm still you know a lot of this is filling at the base here, and really. I could take a lot of this and just kind of zigzag through here. Is that the technical term? Zigzag. Get all this going right through there, here. You know, kind of block this in a bit. Drag and drop it. Hopefully, it doesn't fill the entire screen. Yeah, so I'm just kind of picking apart some of these shapes. Seeing like right there. See how I did like those three shapes? Way too repetitive. Uh, now I can fix that when I go to do the negative drawing, but I'm just pointing that out that when you see things that are ultra repetitive like that, it's best to just get away from it. And things that are supposed to be more organic like hair. And also I should do more where things are uh, going in front and behind of other shapes, other forms. So that's another thing with hair. You shouldn't draw everything too um, parallel or too side by side in a sense. You know, hair hair's got a lot of uh, ribbon-like effects. It flips and folds. But again, I'm just kind of blocking this in. I can go back and fix this with a little of the uh, negative space drawing. Okay, so check it from a distance. I think it's working. I hope it's working. See, I put a lot of time into my hair illustration, but it's the way I like to do it, so this is how I do it. See, and right here, I'm picturing that there's another shape going across the other way, but I feel like this is hurting it, so I'm just going to Lock this in a little bit like this.
Okay, so now come back through here and fix a lot of this craziness. Get this brush down. But yeah, so what I feel like is this right here is all, it looks good, uh, a level up, but down here it looks really awkward. Uh, one thing that you can do to kind of uh, make it look more interesting is cross over the lines, and that's going to give you this zigzagging kind of effect. But like I said, I, I tend to think of it almost like water and waves. But you'll notice, hopefully here in a second, that it'll start to look better just by crisscrossing these lines. Adding a bit more curl into some of these shapes as well. And also, thin down the lines and add some, uh, some smaller details, which helps to... Uh, Convey scale. So you see, I kind of throw some of these in, then undo, redo, and then pull back and check it. And you know, there just needs to be a little bit more blending. So it doesn't, it probably shouldn't stop so abruptly. Um, so I'll just keep messing around with that, but let's get up to here. And this is a shape that I would get in one big like curve and then hold it. really lazy about this since I know the software will just snap it to the area I want. So I spend my time just getting it around, you know, right around the same spot and letting go. And that's it. Doesn't get much easier than that. getting there little by little and I can also still take the layer tone back the opacity and then look for the other shapes beneath you know cause it's not like I'm hitting every shape exactly the way that it is or the way that I had it kind of laid out um, but that's fine I mean I think part of this is finding the shapes uh, for instance if I show you vision here let's see where he's at right there I mean look how different the initial underdrawing was I mean, I totally changed them, but, and I don't even know for the better. I might have to go back and re-edit. I think his face looks a little weird now, but I was trying to make him look a bit more mechanical and, and almost eerie, which is kind of weird, I guess, but I think he is kind of an eerie character, to me anyways. But, yeah, so that's why I did that. But this doesn't have to match the exact underdrawing. Uh, I think sometimes... It's a good idea, you know, if the underdrawing's really nice and you, you want to capture that, you want to retain that. But then there's other times that I, I draw loosely and I try to just kind of figure it out as I'm inking. And sometimes you get the best results that way. So yeah, I think that uh, essentially if you can make it better, make it better. You know, it doesn't have to be true to the... 
you know the uh, original illustration now if it's somebody else's work then that's that's different right you're probably gonna feel a bit more you know um, what's that word that I'm trying to think of a bit more inclined to um, stay true to their artwork but I don't know if it's bad it's bad right you're supposed to fix it or maybe call them up hey you got some really bad feet here you want me to fix your feet no no I'll just leave them I like bad feet I don't know does that happen I don't know I don't think anybody's work so I wouldn't know Tell you the truth, I've only inked other people's work um, a couple times. Mainly it's been because I'm just trying to learn how to be better at inking. So I've inked over, you know, like David Finch, uh, Dale Keehan. Uh, you know, I rec recently came to the conclusion that I haven't inked over my favorite artists. Such a weird thing to think about. But I, I did, it occurred to me, my favorite artist is Todd McFarlane, always has been. And I've never inked over his work, really. I mean, I've drawn it. I've definitely drawn and practiced inking the work that I've drawn by looking at his work. So in a sense, I have. But I've never inked over his work. And I thought, why is that? That's so strange. Then it occurred to me, well, it's because he inks his own work. You know, it's not like I have found pencils of his work online and be like, oh, I'm going to practice inking that. That would be an amazing experience. No, he, he a lot of his work... Um, that I used to follow, um, he would almost immediately go to ink. You know, like he would sketch it out. I think he used like a blue pencil, and then he would start inking it. Well, that that's why I never got in the habit of trying to find his pencils and then inking over them because there weren't as many of his pencils. Now, I do think I, I do still want to ink over his inks. <laughs> kind of sounds silly, right? Uh, but I just. I just feel like it's a great experience to ink over an, an artist that you admire. And there's a reason you admire their work. I always say that. Like, I think that there's something else going on there. It's not that you just admire it, especially as an artist. It's not just that you admire their work. Something is intriguing you in a way that you know that you, you need to learn something there. There's there's something that there you can learn, that hopefully you can learn. I, th I think that's harder to learn from certain artists you know you can admire a certain artist's style and not be able to draw it and that's unfortunate but that does happen uh, there's certain artists that I, I love their style but I just can't draw it as well um, you know again Dale Keehan's a, a good example it comes to my mind where his stuff's so clean and precise and well orchestrated that you know I, I try to do it but I just can't draw that that clean and that uh that well designed um, but I still admire it and I definitely try to grab pieces of the puzzle of his work and and you know do what I can but I just can't draw you know like that guy can draw um, but then there's um, there's other artists that you know certain parts of their work resonate with me more um, so yeah it's just it's just a mixed bag like you just have to find what you can learn from other artists uh, sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, maybe seeing them do it, and then that maybe that makes a light bulb click on for you. So you're like, oh, I was just you know wrong approach. I wasn't drawing it in the way that they were. You know, they they actually approach it in an entirely different way than I was trying. Things like that. Um, but yeah, sometimes I think it's just I, I feel like art is a language. So I feel like sometimes we just don't all speak that same language. You know, some artists uh, speak a, a different visual language than we do, so we can appreciate the work, but we can't always recreate it as well as we'd like. But when we ink over their work, you know, you're you're tracing the steps, right? So, um, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to imply that inkers are tracers. You know, Kevin Smith movie, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, do the whole chase and aiming thing. I'm saying that um, generally, you uh, when you ink over it like especially ink over their inks, you're really trying to capture line line by line what they did, why they made certain choices. Um, so that, that's pretty much what I mean there. So I'll ink over inkers, people like Scott Williams or uh, Danny Mickey or, 
you know, any of the ones that I admire that do these really exceptional inks. And I'll try to really capture the line, especially because I'm working digitally and they're working traditionally. So I try to capture the lines to see if I can even make that line. Cer certain lines I just can't emulate with digital like um, like they can with crow quill and brushes and things. I mean, pretty close, I would say, or, you know, decently enough. But uh, I definitely can't do what they do because there's there's more than just the tools they're using. There's years and years and years of um, developed skill sets, you know, that you're just not going to get simply by tracing their work. But it's a hell of a learning experience is the main thing. You're going to learn immensely from doing it, I think. I, I do anyways. I guess it depends on you as an artist. You might you might learn a lot from that experience and you might walk away with nothing. I don't know. I can't imagine you'd walk away with nothing. Um, just when you start to see the shapes and the forms, you know, that's why repetition is so powerful for this stuff because you it's like a Rubik's Cube, right? I just recently started doing Rubik's Cubes and I finally got to where I can do them without, an, without a YouTube video, which is awesome uh, for me because I, I never could do a Rubik's Cube. But I realized or learned that they're just algorithms. Once you learn the algorithms, it's just a matter of, you know, memorizing them and then getting faster and faster. And there's all sorts of algorithms, but I just learned the ones that I needed or whatever. But these are these are patterns. And when you're doing these illustrations, you start to pick uh, pick apart this stuff and find these patterns. And then it just kind of clicks. You're like, oh, yeah, duh. I've been looking for the wrong shapes, drawing the wrong forms. When I draw the forms this way, it makes sense. And yeah, it's really, I don't know. I, I don't think it's an innate ability like everybody, like a lot of people seem to think. I really don't. I think mean, it's just you, you put so much time in. Well, let's say that it's not an innate ability for everybody. Some people just get really good at working hard and figuring out these techniques, figuring out these shapes and these patterns. And then other people, maybe they have more of an innate ability and it happens way quicker. That's possible. I'm sure that's a that's a thing. But not for me. So for me, it's been lots and lots of hard, tedious work. I'm okay with that. I'm in it for the long game. Oh, sorry, I know I'm deviating and talking about everything from Rubik's Cubes to innate abilities to learn and grow or something. But, um, but yeah, it's all interconnected and I gotta have something to talk about as I take forever to ink this hair but we're almost there we're getting there and you guys always say you want real-time videos so here you go real time baby I'm sorry if I feel a little uh, I'm a little bit um, under the weather and getting over a bit of a cold not the big C word the little C word but um, but yeah starting to feel better and I've been wanting to Get back on the YouTube thing and make you guys more videos and maybe get back on live streaming. Not maybe. I need to get back on live streaming. Um, but I also need some good content ideas from you guys. I th I've been thinking about a contest too. Another art contest. and Yeah, just got to think of some good prizes and how to like do that, how to conduct that. Okay, so on this side, same thing. Now, let me point out one thing that I do tend to think about as I get to this side. So everything is going to be repetitive at this point to what I've showed you. But on this side, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, you know, change up the light source. So she's got power emanating from her hand right here. It really stands to reason that a lot more of this side would be in shadow. But... I don't, I don't want that. So sometimes I'm thinking in terms of, you know, hey, where's the light source, dummy? And then other times I'm like, no, I just want to draw it the way I want to draw it. And I can I can maneuver some things when I go to color it. You know, I, I, I don't know. That's how I look at it. Because I can, I can darken the whole side of her hair when I'm coloring it if I want. If it makes more sense. But I can't really add in a bunch of shapes with the color as much as I would like to if I black it out. So I feel like black is too permanent. And that's why, you know, I don't add as many shadows as I probably should in a lot of instances. Um, but yeah, so right here, the main thing is I'm just going to make sure that the light source 
is pretty strong, obviously to the side where this light, you know, this power is emanating. And that's about it. It's really the same concept. So really it's just a flip from this side to this side, but I'm gonna use a lot more light on the side. So typically when the hair is darker, I do a lot more fill-in. Um, but in this case, on this side, I'm gonna leave a lot of it exposed because I'm gonna use that, uh, what's her, her power is like a purplish color, right? I'm gonna use like a purplish tone, mix in with a little bit of brown for the, the hair here. So, so yeah, I'm just gonna leave a lot of this kind of lighter. But again, notice that these a lot of these shapes are just zigzags, crisscrossing, and kind of like W's. Let's see where I can find one to point it out. Right here, look at that W. It's a really repetitive thing in hair. Another another artist to look at that I think does it really well. Like so, so to me, I think that Dale Kean do, does the negative hairs and, and glares really, really well. Somebody that I think that is good to study for hair that makes it easier to understand is um, Jim Lee. The reason why I say that Jim Lee is obviously one of the best artists ever to walk the earth as far as comics goes. Obviously, everybody knows who Jim Lee is. But what's neat about the way he does hair is it's, it's almost kind of easier to understand, in my opinion. Again, this is that art language thing. You might look at it and go, huh? I don't get it. You, know, it's, you just got to try it. But he simplifies it in a way that it still looks really advanced, really cool. It's almost got a bit of a, um, I don't know how to say it, like a, I don't want to say anime style. I think his characters have a little bit of an anime, you know, American comics anime mix. Um, but I wouldn't say that with the hair. It's just, he does it in a way where it just really kind of reads quickly. I mean, you'll see him do it. I love when he does stuff with a Sharpie because it's the same style. It's the same stuff. He just, he can throw it in so quickly with a Sharpie and it still reads really, really well. And that says a lot about the design of what he's doing. If you can throw it in with a big fat Sharpie and it still makes sense, uh, not only are you just a really exceptional uh, draftsman, illustrator, you know, but uh, it just shows that there's an idea working there that works even if you're using a, a ballpoint pen or a big Sharpie. I, so, you know, definitely check out his stuff. But when he does hair, he does that W shape a lot. Uh, zigzags and Ws. Uh, he's one of the first people, when I watched like an old video of him back in the day, and him and Stan Lee, uh, you guys probably all know the one I'm getting ready to mention, the, the video where they're, you know, teaching you how to draw, and it was filmed way back. And, uh, man, he looked like he was a kid, maybe... I don't know if he was even 20 yet, but somewhere in there. And uh, he was explaining how he draws, and he was really calling out the basic shapes. Like an arm was a football, or a bicep was a football. And, um, you know, he, he was just really naming those basic shapes as he went. And it, that's one of the first times I remember that clicking for me. Up until then, I think I was just looking at things and drawing them. And that was it. I wasn't really putting, like, a, a bunch of other devices into place but after watching that and having him speak that way about things like um, you know breaking everything down into those shapes and those forms it's like I couldn't stop doing it like to this day I think about that every time I, I do that and I do that often I always I always look for the patterns the shapes the things that I can commit to memory so that almost so I can quit thinking about it you know I could just kind of react versus trying to, you know, um, make the right choice all the way through the artwork. It's, it's a, something about that is exhausting. You know, you want to get to a point where you've done it enough times and you no longer think that way. You just react. So, yeah, you know, check out his stuff for that. Fantastic. You know, use the negative lines to get the breakup. So, for instance, one of the great things about using the, the negative lines in this is that if you don't do that, it's very easy to use these shapes over and over again, right? And then not, they don't look broken up. They look side by side. Everything looks too parallel to it, to itself and it flattens right out. But what's neat about the uh, the lines going across, whether they be, you can actually, you can do solid ones like this as you go and then come back and highlight them 
I'll do that sometimes, but really there's enough of the drawing here. I can just do what I'm doing here, and then you'll see at the very end we'll do some negative lines going through it. But it breaks it up, and it makes it look more interesting. Uh, but if I didn't do that and I had all these shapes just kind of going back and forth, it's not that it would look bad. It's just something about that little whiteout kind of effect really pushes it to that next level. So again, as we get down here, uh, I want to bring more of the tips of the hair as a solid. I'm not doing as much of that because the light source is right next to the hair, so I don't feel like it needs to be as predominant as it was on the other side. But I still want that you know a little bit of that in there. And then I also tend to make it darker as it you know gets to the character and behind the head, so I can really fill this in. I don't need all that. I think it looks better like that. And then again the shape. Now another thing we can do too, because it's getting really close to the, the light source, right? You can also thin out the lines on the top <clears throat> or where the light is hitting predominantly. And you can even omit parts of the line. Let me see if I can get this into place and show you what I'm talking about here. I feel like I want to see a little bit of this right here. I don't know why. Just kind of going off what I see in those little bits of uh, that little bit of uh, value drawing that I did underneath. Yeah, so right on the very edge, I could go back and I could erase some little bits of these lines. It just basically looks like, you know, the light source is hitting it so hard that it's it's in front the light is in front of the edge of the hair so again just little things like that where basically whenever you have thinner lines or omission of lines line gaps that generally denotes uh, a light source a highlight and then also again like I said it really helps to break this stuff up make this a little bit thicker and just throw some of these li these lines right in front of the other forms other shapes I got this one right here and I don't like it though. So I just need to play around with that one, but and then you know pull back and see if it makes sense from a distance. And then I'd probably go right down into this area. And again, just kind of soften up the transition a little bit. It feels like it's too abrupt. Play around with that a little bit. Yeah, and that's really it. So yeah, I know this was a long video. Um, hopefully it's been informative for you. But that's essentially how I work through hair. And I know it's a slow process for the way that I do it. Uh, but it's it's the way I do it. It's the way that I find that gives me the best end result. Uh, and it's not that I do every hairstyle like that. Like basically ones that have more curls and more waves, I go for this. Uh, but that's a lot of times why I like those straight hairstyles and and short hair as well it's way way faster but uh, at any rate hopefully this has taught you a thing or two i'd love to know what you think in the comments section below as well as what other videos you'd like to see in the future i'll make sure to get those on the channel so as always keep drawing keep having fun and bye for now